you're listening to the Saluki Games Cast. This is finals week, episode Yay. 80 for May 10th, 2024. My name is Justin Young. Joining me as always are Alicia Utech and Mario Sanders. How are you guys doing? Doing okay. The week is nearly done. All of my work is nearly done. Nearly? Nearly. I've got one more one more final thing that I'm will need to complete. How about you, Alicia? How's your finals week going? It is that time of the semester, Justin. <laughs> it is that time of the semester. I feel like this is the one time you can say that and it, it really feels earned. Yeah. No, I'm actually I'm I'm doing okay. I you know, I stayed up until two AM from Wednesday into Thursday doing a presentation that was due Wednesday at eleven fifty nine, but we also had tornado warnings, so I feel like I got to, I got to have it be a little late. <laughs> but now I just Up until about that time too. I yeah. that last one what ended at like 10 45 or something like that. Yeah. yeah. My so. my cat was very nervous. Mm. Oh, my cat did not care. <laughs> he I like scooped him up and like brought him into the downstairs bathroom, and he was just like, "What? Why?" I like brought a toy in for him to keep him busy and he was like, okay, poke. <laughs> I'm going to just like curl up now. <laughs> yeah, for me, that was uh, basically last Wednesday to this Wednesday was like the most stressful period just because of uh, certain right. assignments that were due. And so you had the 48 hour exam. Yeah, we had a 48 hour exam from Monday to Wednesday. Um, what? <laughs> you had a 48 had, hour exam. Uh, uh, 48 hours to write an exam not like 48 hours straight <laughs> okay oh yeah yeah it was uh i was thinking that sounds like a comp exam you're not doing your comps yet <laughs> no the uh no the exam was posted on monday we had 48 hours to complete it um but uh so that was like the most stressful thing the other two um are not necessarily more laid back, but for lack of a better term, more laid back. And I can thankfully say that because one of them is for Christina, but she's not here. <laughs> <laughs> Hoping she doesn't listen to this exactly, before she exactly. grades. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I was going to joke when you had posted about it. Like, well, no, I got a thing that's due on Friday, but I think maybe the, you know, the professor will be a little okay with it. <laughs> nope. Take a two hour break. She's not here. <laughs> she's at home right now grading you harshly. <laughs> She's like, Mario hasn't turned. It's due at 11.59 p.m., but Mario hasn't turned it in eight hours before that. And he's taking a two-hour break to record a video game podcast. <laughs> Slacker. The audacity. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, it's been, it is a crazy time of the semester. Um, I had to finish a video game that I had to develop entirely myself mm -hmm. uh, for the class Um you made two video games this semester? Yes, we made one collectively as a class. That took like three quarters of the semester. And then we made the last one in like a month by ourselves. Dang. Um, and I'll just say up front, like I am perfectly happy with what I did. I think it's fine. Uh, I think if I had, you know, like any free time at all, I would have made something um, that I'd be, you know, even more proud of. I was blown away by what some people in that class did. Just like, um, like kind of just amazing games that they made. That's cool. Uh, so that's something uh, we'll get those up on the website um, after they're all finished and everything. Um, some people are still working on them up until today, I guess. On the Saluki Games website? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, we'll we'll have links. We have links to the game that the class did collectively up there. Mm -hmm. So you can go to SalukiGames.com and play that game. Uh, but once everyone's done, um, hopefully we can get links up there because some of those are really cool. Um, there's a game where you play as a fish and... <gasps> But, like, you're playing as a fish in a kitchen, so you have to flop around <laughs> everywhere through the kitchen. And it, it's just a, it's an amazing game. Like, the art in it's fantastic, and the way that you're interacting with the world is pretty fantastic. And, like, for a month to do that entire game, sure. uh, like, I was just blown away. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, there's a, a, a huge amount of talent in there. Um, there's another one that's sort of a, um, a point-and-click adventure. Mm -hmm. Um but, you know, it's very much in kind of the uh, Maniac Mansion sort of style. That's what it reminded me of. 
Um, this, I don't think the student had ever played <laughs> Maniac uh, Mansion. Uh, by far the oldest reference you could possibly make. <laughs> Thanks <laughs> reminds me of. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, I could have mentioned Colossal Cave Adventure. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I can't help it. That's what it made me think of. <laughs> I'm, yes, I am an old man, Mario. Thank you for reminding me. You're welcome. Um, so, um, yeah, it'll be fun when you're in my class next semester. <laughs> um, but anyways, yeah. So, like, I mean, they're just, like, a whole bunch of creativity. I think lots of them are really good. Uh, those two kind of s- stick out because of just the amount of art assets in them and everything where you feel like, oh, this, like, like if you had a if you had a year to work on this, this could be something you could sell on Steam. Mm. Like mm-hmm. it may not be the breakout hit of the year, but like this would be completely acceptable as a uh, commercial video game. Um, so I, I'm just impressed, right? Like a month of development time, basically. Maybe it's a little more, um, but I feel like that's all I had was about a month. Uh, and for them to get all that done. Well, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, the eclipse was April 8th. I was going to say, it's been a right. month since the eclipse. So if you worked on it yeah. after that game. Yeah, and we really we started a, a, after that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Kevin Mercer was the professor in that. He's been here on the podcast before and everything. So it's just a, you know, a, neat, um, a neat workshop environment to, to do all that in. And so... Uh, like I said, when those are ready and everything, we'll try to get links up on the website and talk about that on the podcast. Maybe we can play some of those and talk about them yeah. as a group. That'd yeah. be kind of fun to do. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it. Why don't we just go ahead and jump right into what you've been playing? We've been off for a couple of weeks, so Alicia, um, obviously super busy. I don't know that any of us are going to have a ton to talk about here, but... Have you been playing anything, Alicia? So, yes, I've been super busy, and also I have procrastinated horribly by playing Ace Attorney. (laughs) I might be slightly obsessed. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's understandable. You you made it to at least the second game, is that right? I beat the first two games. I'm on the second trial of the third game. Wow. Okay. Yeah, you've blaze through those yeah i'm i may be slightly obsessed (laughs) but i don't know i feel like i'm having a similar experience to like when i watched the godfather movies for the first time where i was like why didn't anyone tell me that these were so good (laughs) i i was very careful wording that to say these are not similar things (laughs) i I was wondering similar experience on my head (laughs) I was wondering what that connection was going to be. Like, it's like those games are nothing like the Godfather. No, <laughs> but like, you know, I watched those movies and I was like, why didn't anyone tell me they were so good? And everyone was like, because you, you should just know that. I was like, were you not paying attention? I feel like that's not, okay. Anyways, and it's like the same thing. Like Ace Attorney, my sister has told me for years how good it is. Like, I remember how much Ryan talked about it and how good mm. it was. And I just... You know, for years, all I saw was, like, the objection.lols that people would post on right. YouTube. And so I only ever saw the silly things. Mm. And, you know, like, cross-examining a parrot and all of that. And, like, then actually playing it, I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> it does such... It's such a well-balanced series in terms of balancing the humor and the seriousness, in terms of balancing the sense of I was tr- I was telling this to one of my friends because she was like oh it's been on my list like should I get it and I'm like yes <laughs> so like it does such a good job I think of balancing the the mystery of who did it why did they do it and how did it happen and in a way where it's the it's not the Sherlock Holmes model where you know Sherlock gives you an answer and you don't know how he did it until he explains it because Watson doesn't have the information that Sherlock does. Right. But it's like, it's the Ellery queen model where you're the, the things that you don't know, you're getting the information with the characters to figure it out. And I'm like, yes, it's so good. And freaking, I'm not used to, and this may be 
reflective on me as a person. <laughs> but I'm I typically latch onto series and characters where like No. You don't <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no valid. <laughs> but like I tend to latch onto series with characters where bad things happen and they don't like it always haunts them for the rest of the series. Versus, like, that's not how I would describe Sonic. Well, okay, when we're getting into I real emotional knock series, that chili dog out of his hand. <laughs> <laughs> when, we're, when we're talking actually emotional series, but like the, having the, the, the dark haunting of Sonic. <laughs> oh, but so that like, time I went too fast. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, but I say this because <laughs> getting to like, you know, follow through, you know, in the second Ace Attorney game when like Will Powers shows up again and like the third Ace Attorney game, the, I just got reintroduced to a, a character who was one of the witnesses in the last trial in the second game. And they're like living healthy lives. <laughs> and I'm like, what is this? And like, I don't know. I, I just, it's so good. I, I think you heard it here, folks. Alicia is a fangirl, and she <laughs> likes to fangirl over things. Breaking news. No, that's really cool. I've, I've never played any of them. I have have a number of them just on either Steam or the Great Ace Attorney's collection they put out, but mm. haven't played them. They've always been on the black hole that is a backlog. So that's it's yeah. always exciting to, you know, it's one of those things that, you hear somebody talk really highly about a game that you've heard so many other people talk really highly about right. that you have, but you haven't played. And you're like, I'm so mad at myself <laughs> eventually, but that's yes. really cool that you're excited. You're enjoying them so much. I'm also really glad you just said that. Cause I almost said something that is, you know, okay. in the, the first games game are like that would 20 years old. I, I yeah. don't think you can blame yourself for spoiling that. Yeah. But, but, I, but I would though, because there are things even like I was, I was talking to my sister because of course, Okay, this this one I'm not counting as spoilers. There is no straight explanation for Miles Edgeworth having unnecessary feelings. <laughs> like there there is no straight explanation. Rightworth is canon. And so of course I had to go start reading fix. And so I got spoiled on some things and my sister is like because when I said that, my sister was like, I'll try to send you fix that don't spoil things. So I was like, oh, no, I'm already spoiled on, <laughs> you know, I know who Trucy is. I know about the seven-year gap. I know all that. And then she was like, okay, tell me exactly what you know, though. So I told her fair. things. That's fair. I told her things, and she was like, okay, cool. So there are still some surprises coming up. And I, like, I think one of the things that's really interesting, you talking about this, and, and you were talking about, like, the meme, right? So mm -hmm. the memes that people would create out of this and you talking about like well it didn't have a whole lot of interest to me because of the memes and like i felt like very familiar with it and then you were talking about um the godfather right which is one of those films that through sort of cultural osmosis you learn some of it right yeah like you learn the uh every time i think i'm out they keep pulling me back in and you know like i'll make him an offer he can't refuse and like, I wonder if that is sometimes, like, a, a detriment to I think art. so. That you have some familiarity with it, but you don't actually have the depth of knowledge for well, the appreciation? Or well, that think, that holds you back from engaging with it? Well, think about, like, Earthbound. So, like, you played Earthbound last year, right? Was it last year? Yes. Okay, so, like, Earthbound, I feel like, is one of those games that if you haven't played it, you kind of feel like you have played it. Yeah. Like, you feel like you know enough, so, like... If you're trying to decide between that and another game, it's easier to pick another game because you already feel like you're so familiar with Earthbound. Yeah. And so I wonder if that does hurt media sometimes because I have such a familiarity with this that I feel like I don't really need to investigate it. So because I've done the same thing as you. Like I've often, there's this thing everybody praises and I'm like, yeah, I, I kind of already know what that is. I, I don't need to watch that or play it or read it or whatever. And it's stupid. Like everybody's praising this and saying it's the greatest thing ever. Why am I avoiding it? Yeah, I, th I think so. And I think it's important. Like I, I tend to, in my head, be like, 
oh no, the problem is when people are like judgy about it. Like, oh, well that's popular. I'm not into it because it's popular. I'm not going to watch it. And it's like, but no, I even do that with things where I'm like, yeah, I want to watch that someday or play it someday. But like, I have so much cultural osmosis. Like you can't not know objection from Ace Attorney if you're on the internet at all. If you're terminally online. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so like that cultural osmosis of like, yeah, I know what it's about. So like, I'll get to it someday. Mm-hmm. And then when you finally do get to it and be like, oh my gosh, this is why it's so everybody freaked out about it. Like you said. Yeah, no, I, I think, and I guess what I'm getting at is, is, and maybe this is what you're, you're saying. Whereas I feel like I, I know enough about it, but not really having whatever that depth of, of knowledge is that lends to the real appreciation that mm-hmm. comes from. It's like, it's a lawyer game. And it's like, I, I know what to expect when playing a, a lawyer game, but and the yet you nuances, <laughs> you know, of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's one of the things that you pointed out, Alicia, about like the characters coming back and that you think it's going to be much more mechanical than s- the story driven that mm-hmm. it turns out to be like that. There's this sort of lore in the games and everything. And I remember playing through, I think I've only ever played the first two uh, Phoenix Wright games. Mm-hmm. And I remember like having the same reaction as you, like, oh, this character is coming back. Oh, this case relates back to this case. And yeah. like, oh, this is actually more interesting than I thought. It does such a good job at layering and foreshadowing and building connections and like actually feeling like the continuity between the between not even just across a single game, but between all of the games matters. Yeah. And I think I'm so used to games where like it, it even even direct sequels sometimes will feel like how much does the continuity really matter? Right. Outside of Mass Effect, right? Like it's not really a thing that a lot of games feature. Yeah. Those are made by Capcom, is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because, but then Marvel versus Capcom, you got to have Phoenix Wright and Maya Fey as fighters. <laughs> I just, I think about it as, you know, the closest comparison I could make for like my own experience of playing games like that would be the Zero Escape games. Mm-hmm. And it's like the revelation yeah. of, oh, this character is related to this character. This thing is related to this thing. And there's something very exciting about that. So, yeah. yeah. Like when you start, you know, in the first game, the DL6 incident carries carries weight throughout the whole game and so like when when you find little pieces pointing towards that in the second case you're like huh this is kind of this is interesting i want and then the third case you find more Mm. and then the fourth case deals with it very directly and here's and like i'm going back and watching now you know just for background noise i'm putting on luca jin's playthrough of the first game and watching back and seeing these moments even that I was like, they they don't in the game explicitly say, oh, the DL6 case in this moment. But seeing that, that and going like, I see what you did there. And well, even seeing things that are pointing to like the second mm-hmm. game, things that'll matter. And I'm like, I see what you did there. And those to me are always the most exciting playthroughs to watch. Like those types, very narrative heavy, mm-hmm. almost visual novel type of games just because i don't know there's the surprise of you learn that you the thing is finally revealed and, yeah. and i feel like those moments of revelation for me at least at least and maybe it's just because of, of that's how i felt when i played them but mm-hmm. like seeing somebody else go through that as compared to a, I don't know a playthrough of like god of war or yeah. a mario game or a legend of zelda or something like that yeah absolutely and like and very much that sense of like I I deliberately did not watch Luca's Ace Attorney playthroughs because I knew it was a visual novel and mm. I knew, you know, at some point I was probably gonna play it. And then like you said, getting to have those moments of discovery myself and then now going back and watching her have those moments mm-hmm. and her have those moments where there's a there's a comment that she made I'm watching her she's on the third case right now and there's a comment that she makes about about one of the elements 
that you just mm -hmm. you just see. It's about a, a fence that's there mm -hmm. that ends up being the twist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's just like everyone in the comments being like, say nothing. <laughs> Well, and, and right. And that's, that's where it's like, and you remember how you felt when you saw it for the first time. Right. And so like, I think about that, I guess the only, the other games that were like that for me were the, um, the Yakuza games mm -hmm. watching a, yeah. people play through those and, and same thing while not a visual novel, incredibly narrative, narratively deep. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's cool that one you've again, enjoyed them so much and that, yeah, getting to, to watch and like, almost like re-experience the excitement of having it. Cause yeah. those are games that you can't, I don't know. You can't really go back and play them a second time. I mean, you could, of course, but I'll say you, I feel like you miss out on the, I don't know, the hype of the, the, the peaks. I don't, you hit, don't hit the same highs. Yeah. Um, I because like, you know what to expect or you know the, the twist that's coming. Yeah. I would rather watch a blind playthrough mm -hmm. than than replay it because like you said, it's it's that first experience. It's that yeah. that moment, you know, there's so many moments in this game where I and in these games, period, where I'm like the moment when you catch the contradiction in the testimony and you know realize what piece of evidence you need, or where someone says something and you're like Hang on here. I think we need to get you on the witness stand. <laughs> it's just, it's so good. And like, I, I can't re-experience that by replaying it because I know what the correct path is. Yeah. But watching someone play it blind and get the experience it, just like riding that high with them and be like, yes, this is it. <laughs> this is it. And it's so, it's so good. I love, I love how the the lore building and the world building and the continuity are all on point, mm -hmm. and that just makes me so happy. Because <laughs> again, you know, I'm I'm very used to. Yes, the only example I can really think of is like, you know, when you play, when you play. Pokemon Gen 2 for the first time and you be, you mm. get to Kanto for the first time and you realize that it's the sequel and you're like, oh my gosh. Sure. <laughs> Versus like Black 2 and White 2, you know that it's a sequel, but it doesn't feel like a sequel to Black and White because the cities are in different places and you're to have different gym leaders and all that. Whereas this, it's like, yeah, you have the carryover of you've always got you and Maya, and you've always got Edgeworth, but then you also have the carryover of these minor characters. Where, mm -hmm. you know, Will Powers is your client in game one, and he's there in game two. And again, like this witness in one of the game two cases is now, I get, I'm not very far, so I don't know exactly what role she's playing in this, but she's involved in they're a case. There. She's yeah, involved yeah. in a case in game three. <laughs> right. Yeah, it, it's a... It's a really cool uh, series, and I, I remember talking to Ryan while they were playing through it, and um, and they were having very similar reactions, like, oh, this is actually, like, much cooler than I realized it would be. Um, and I, I think there's always, like, games like that mm -hmm. that, like, you hear about, and you're like, yeah, I kind of have an idea what that game is, and then when you actually play it, you know, sometimes you're disappointed, but, like, sometimes you come away and you're like, Oh, actually, that was much more than I thought it was going to be. Like, the game I had created in my head wasn't the full scope that the game turned out to be. Yeah. Um, and so that's always kind of like a, a, a cool feeling. It's always nice to be surprised positively in that way. Yeah. Um. All right. Um. Mario, what have you been playing? I have not played a ton. Um, Balatro, on when I want to take a little bit of a break i don't know when the last time we recorded was if i had beaten uh, all of the challenges so i think you still had jokerless left yeah. last time we yeah. recorded so i i beat jokerless after they uh dropped the patch because the patch changed certain uh cards and how they affected scoring specifically it changed some of the planets and how they uh boosted scores and it definitely makes it easier 
I wouldn't say it's easy, but easier for sure. Um, but yeah, that, uh, I think the other thing, Justin, I had mentioned in our group chat, I played the Europa demo that you talked about. Right. That's about a, maybe a month or so ago. Mm-hmm. And I definitely would have similar critiques. That game is very floaty. Um, I think that that game would be really cool as a speed run game. There's a lot of like the ways that you can sort of like fly through the levels and you regain your hover power throughout. Um, I think the way that that could be sequenced would be really impressive to watch for somebody who's gotten to a high level of it. And I think it's one that I, I think we agreed in the, the chat. It's a game that I would buy, but not for full price. I think it's like it's asking right. $30 is what it said, maybe even $20. When it goes on sale, inevitably, if it's like a, you know, 10 bucks or something like that, I would pick it up for that. But uh, for what it is, whatever whatever it's listed at now is like, mm, I don't know if I would spend that much on it. But it's it's a cool it's a cool game. It's one that I would check out. But yeah, I don't know. I would. It's not at the top of the list by any means. Yeah, I mean, the looks of it get you real excited yeah. for it. And then when you actually touch the controller, you're like, oh, this <laughs> this isn't playing the way I want it to play. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean, like, that's the demo. I haven't played the full game. Maybe the full game feels different. Maybe it's tuned a little bit differently. Um, usually you don't get a dramatic change between demo and the full game. Um, but yeah, I mean, I also, it was a game, I also got to the point where I was like, was well, this all I'm doing? Like, yeah, there's some light puzzle solving, but is, is that all there is to this game? Or is this game going to open up into something more? I didn't even feel like there was much light puzzle solving. It felt very much like traversal, more, yeah. more so than anything, which isn't bad. Um, again, just getting to walk around that landscape, uh, it's a gorgeous game. And right. so like, that that is incentive enough but yeah if if it's just sort of traversing the terrain i don't know if i would be as uh interested in picking it up but so it would have to i'd have to watch a not a playthrough but like see what the full game adds to it yeah and i think with a game like that that's one of those games where like the number of hours of gameplay actually comes into question because like that, the, the gameplay and the concept seem like it can sustain maybe two or three hours, but then that game at $30 for two or three hours, Mm -hmm. like you were saying, doesn't feel worth it. Yeah. Um, And certainly like a two or three hour game can certainly be entirely worth $30, but like, I mean, that's going to depend, you know, each individual person, but I feel like that's a big question mark on that game. Yeah, and and I I should uh, retract. I don't know how much it, it's going to cost. I I don't know if I saw that somewhere or if I just made that up in my head. But I think that's where it's one of those. It would depend on what the price is to really. I would say that game's at least twenty dollars. That would be my guess as well. I can't imagine it being any less than that. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. I did play a couple of things here. Um, uh, last episode, I talked about Mini Shoot Adventures. I just started playing that game. Um, I completed that game now. Um, I, that's a fantastic game. That's a game I, you know, wholeheartedly recommend to people. Um, if you like dual stick shooters, if you like Zelda, uh, sort of games or classic Zelda 2D um, overhead perspective. That game is just incredibly well made. It paces its uh, reveals out like very well throughout the game. Um, Even when you think that you have completed a large section of that game, that game does little twists that like kind of reveal that there's more going on in the game than you think. Um, I, you know, there's a there's a point in that game where you gain an ability and you're like, oh, well, they just broke their game by giving me this ability. And then you realize, oh, wait, no, there's so much more going on here than I at first thought. Um, but yeah, so if 
somebody's listening and didn't hear me talk about it the first time, it is a 2D overhead Zelda-like, except instead of Zelda controls, you are piloting a little ship and you're using dual stick controls. You uh, There are dungeons that you have to complete. There are four main dungeons. Um, and there are bosses at the end of those dungeons that become very much sort of bullet hell focused. Um, so like bullets just covering the entire screen you having to memorize the patterns and like dodge the bullets um, is a pretty easy to pick up and play game. Like it's not a game I died very much until like close to the end of the game. Um, and then there are some pretty challenging parts right near the end. Uh, but like, I think it's a game that's very accessible and I was playing on the medium difficulty, the default one, there's an easier setting that you can set it down to. There are also some accessibility controls in that game that let you slow down the game, for example, or um, give yourself unlimited energy um, that allows you to do things like boost around. Um, and so I thought that was really cool because like there was no punishment for using those. Like I turned them on after I'd gotten to the end of the game just to see how they worked. And I was like, oh, this is like, really cool that it just lets you do this mm -hmm. yeah normally you have to get mods for stuff like that yeah or, or they like punish you in some way right like they're going to say well we're not going to give you achievements or we're not going to do this and you can't finish the game truly sure. using this um and th none of that seems to be in there so it seems to be a real accessible game um yeah if you like those sorts of games i wholeheartedly recommend that it also, um, again, I'm going to be careful here not to spoil anything. The end of that game goes some interesting places um, that really I was like, oh, that's cool. They're doing something um, more fun with this ending than I was expecting. Um, and I think that's there was a, a tweet, or not a tweet, um, thread um, on threads where somebody was playing off of that and it made me laugh because I was like, oh, people who are seeing this are going to be very confused by this game screen and they're really having a lot of fun with like the fact that this is this game is doing something uh, really kind of meta and cool with itself. So um, yeah, just just a really fun game to play. Like I, I just can't recommend it enough. It's um, right up there is one of my favorite games I've played this year so far. Um, the other game that's, I, that's high praise. Yeah, just you know, knowing how I mean, knowing how much you liked uh, Balatro, I don't know how much what what else you've played, but I mean, for it to be already to for it to be up there as a top contender as of now, yeah, that, that's a, that's high praise. Yeah, I mean, Balatro is a, a really cool game, right? Like, and that's a game. You know, I, I didn't have it on my list here, but like, yes, I've been playing that, mm -hmm. right? Well, like when I'm in the middle of like grading stuff and I need a break, I can switch over and just play a few hands of that. And it, you know, it, um, decompresses my brain. It feels mm -hmm. like, um, so yeah, that's a great game too. You know, this, it's weird. This has been a good year for games so far. Like everybody I think thought after 2023, it was going to be a rough year for games. And we're going to talk about here in a bit. It has been, but not with the actual quality of the games. Mm -hmm. Like the game industry has had some rough times, but the actual games coming out, like we've had really fantastic games. Like I would say both of those are fantastic. Obviously, Hell Divers 2, you've played a, a lot of Mario. Um, you know, that Princess Peach game, I've heard lots of positive things about. I, I think it's a very, you know, it's aimed at a very particular audience, but like the people who have who are in that audience who have played that game seem to really like it. Yeah. Um, that, but, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was just say, yeah, Princess Peach and, and Hell Divers, not necessarily, but I think with the other two and really a lot of the games that we end up talking about, maybe because they're the most affordable, so it's easy to pick them up, you know, indie games are just really feel like they're like driving what the industry is doing. And, you know, a lot of people's top games list, I think you're going to see a lot of indie games on them as compared to maybe last year where right. you had a lot of these triple a developed games. Yeah. Last year was the anomaly, right? Like sure. last, you know, you go back two years ago, our number one game, our game of the year was an indie game and it was a little $3 indie game. Right. And so last year was the kind of anomaly and they, 
you had these big sixty, seventy dollar triple A packaged products that you know just ate up our top ten. Yeah, I don't. Did you ever play or check out the Prince of Persia game? I haven't yet. That's okay. one I, I've. That game is not on Steam, so uh, okay. it, it's kind of prevented me. It is on uh, Switch, so I think I'll probably pick it up and play it on there. I feel like I haven't heard as much about that one, but didn't know if you've. And I, I mean, the one that just came out. Uh, I didn't know if anybody would would have played it. I figured I'll probably hold off for a while. Is uh, Hades two the right? Uh, yeah, early access just came out. I, mean, I want to say it was this week. Yeah, um, but I mean, I I just I have to imagine that'll be another one that will probably be very high on people's lists at the end yeah. of the year as well. I, that's a game that I've sort of avoided so far because it's early access, mm-hmm. and I don't like playing early access games usually. <laughs> um, especially a game that has a story like that, right? Like I, I care less if it's a multiplayer game or even something like Bellatro where, you know, sure. it's sort of an evolving game. Um, but those ones where there's a beginning, middle and end, I, I sort of want to be able to play through it and not, you know, potentially have to restart at some point. Yeah. That's kind of my mentality as well. I think the cost is, and as well, I'll just wait for it to come out. I can't, you know, I only played Hades for the first time last year, so it's not like, oh my god, I've been waiting forever for this game. <laughs> There's enough other games to... An infinite list of other games to play <laughs> in many ways. Starting with Ace Attorney. <laughs> yeah. um, the other game I played a little bit of is a title called Manor Lords. Um, this was one of the like most wish-listed games on Steam, which seemed kind of surprising to me. Um, this came out on uh, Xbox Game Pass, so that's where I played it. Um, so this is a city building game, um, you know, so think, uh, think a little bit like a, uh, a sim city, but also think a little bit like, uh, an age of empires, right? So like you're having to, uh, research different things and you're having to build materials. So you have to chop down trees over here, but then you have to convert those chop down trees into firewood so that you can do this other thing over here. And you have to have ox uh, that can move that. So they'll actually drag the trees over to the, uh, the spot where they'll convert it into firewood. Um, and it is a very beautiful game. Um, like everything in that game looks suitably like dirty yeah. <laughs> for like this medieval game. Um, and, uh, Though I, it's my understanding that they actually brought in real historians to try to get it actually correct so that everything doesn't look like it does in a film, that it actually looks like... So, like, the real Middle Ages weren't as dirty as you see them in movies, right? Mm-hmm. Like, when they go in and they film a movie, they go in and just throw mud and dirt over everything, and, like, historians, apparently, that makes them really angry, and they're like, no, that's not what it looked like. People didn't just live in mud all the time. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> They, they knew how to make, like, buildings and stuff. Like, what are you talking about? Um, but it, it does have that look of, like, you feel like you're in that era and you feel like the world is a living, breathing world as you're, um, as you're building it. And it's meant to look like the Middle Ages, not have the aesthetic of the Middle Ages. Potentially to have a more historically accurate aesthetic, right? Um So it's good so far. I I didn't play a whole lot of it. I feel like I'm just sort of, you know, those sorts of games, you really have to learn the mechanics and learn the correct, you know, you have to do this first to balance this out and everything. Um, But, you know, like the thing I will say is that it's very detailed so that you see all of that happening on screen. It's not like it's a spreadsheet all happening in the background. So like, there's more of a visual um, landmark that you can look to and say, okay, well, those trees that the oxen have moved those trees over here. So, you know, now that is that building's getting uh, constructed and everything. And so um, you would think that visual fidelity wouldn't matter in a game like that, but in this case it actually sort of does. Um, And that's kind of neat to see. Um, Yeah. I had a friend who, he was he was part of that wish list. Uh, yeah, um, he was really looking forward to it. He's been playing it a good bunch. I've watched a little bit of it. I think those are games that are so far out of like what 
I play or those games are too big brain for me usually. Sure. Um, so I haven't paid a ton of attention, but I know he's also having a good time. And I would agree with, I you know laughed at, at you talking about the look of it because yeah, it does feel like it nails the look really, really well. It's got a good, good look to it. Yeah, and I, I love those sorts of games. I, I don't have as much time to play them anymore. So maybe now that it's in the semester, mm-hmm. you know, that's the sort of game that you start playing at, you know, four o'clock in the <laughs> afternoon, and all of a sudden it's four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and like I haven't eaten. The cat is outside, like screaming at me. <laughs> like what? What has come of my life? Um, that was easier to do when I was like 21. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I feel like if I do that, I will, I can potentially really get into this game. Mm-hmm. So we'll see how that goes. Um, all right. That's what we've been playing. Let's get on into the news. Um, and as I noted, there's some, uh, some more crazy news going on in the game industry this week. So let's get right to it. Uh, Xbox this week shuttered four of their studios. Um, So those studios were Arcane Austin. So they have worked on Redfall, uh, the new Prey, um, and the original Dishonored. Uh, Tango Gameworks, which most recently made Hi-Fi Rush. They also did the Evil Within games and Ghostwire Tokyo. Uh, Alpha Dog, which made a uh, mobile game called Mighty Doom, uh, based on the Doom franchise. Um, And then Roundhouse Games. um, The other three are getting shut down. Roundhouse Games is actually going to get merged into ZeniMax Online Studios, which does Elder Elder Scrolls Online. Um, They've been a support studio, so they're not a studio that's been out there making entire games by themselves up to this point. So um, they sound like the least, you know, I guess dramatic uh, outcome of this. Um, but this news obviously shocked people. Um, you know, obviously Redfall was sort of a disaster, but Arcane's track record prior to that had been, you know, pretty outstanding. Um, and Tango Gameworks is coming off a game that last year, you know, I think made our top 10. I know it made my top 10 games of the year and was like a, you know, critically and also consumer praised quite a bit. Um, so I feel like Hi-Fi Rush was just in general, like not even just our lists, but a general top 10 game for a, for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know that was one of the things, you know, from the different games people that I follow on social media, you know, that was their kind of reaction was like, if you ever needed evidence, this is proof that it's not these studios that are getting shut down. It's not because they're making bad games, you know, Yeah, it's just, it's the money and it's whatever the people upstairs think, because even if with how big of a year last year was hi-fi rush was still that highly praised at the end of the year. It was yeah. still the critical dar- a critical darling. Um, the surprise hit because I think it was like, kind of shadow dropped, you know, right. It came yeah. out the day that it was announced. Um, and, uh, and I mean, I think, people, you know, I, I've never played either Ghostwire Tokyo or the evil within, but I think people like those games. People, I'll say they're, they're familiar titles yeah. to me, even if I don't know them. I feel like we talked about the evil within games not that long ago. Maybe it was a different yeah. series we were talking about, but uh, yeah, I mean that one I think is certainly the most surprising is this, so I don't know how this works. Arcane Austin would be different than the other Arcane Studios. Right. Okay. So, so no, Arcane, one of them made Deathloop. Right. So that is the other Arcane okay. Studio. Um, Arcane. Uh, Le- Leon, maybe. Leon, yeah. Um, yeah, and so, and my understanding is that they worked together to make the first Dishonored, but then when it came to Dishonored 2, uh, Arcane Leon take, took over that, but the director of that game was still at Arcane Austin. Mm-hmm. So, like, it's a very convoluted sort of history. Um, but obviously, they've been had their hands in several successful games. Sure, mm-hmm. um, you know that whole sort of um, immersive sim, right? Sort of style of game, like we're we're going to put you into this environment and the things that you do are going to change the way that mm-hmm. the NPCs are interacting and all of this, 
right? Def Loop was sort of the, I guess, pinnacle of that, of this sort of like clockwork machinery of the way these game, uh, this game world operates. Um, yeah, so like Hi-Fi Rush is the one that's been getting, I think, all the focus because, you know, like Redfall is this sort of big disaster. So as part of this, they announced that uh, Redfall, they're going to stop all development because if you remember after Redfall was a disaster last year when it came out, they said, oh, well, we're going to continue to support this. We're going to fix it up. And there was a DLC that was still promised for the game uh, because people had pre-bought that as part of like an ultimate edition. Mm -hmm. And um, as part of this, they came out and announced, hey, we're stopping all development on this and that DLC is never coming out. We're going to make good with the people who have already paid for that. Um, I don't think they've announced yet how they're going to do that. Usually it's like, Hey, we'll give you a free game or, or yeah. something in place of that. Um, give you credits for the Xbox store, PS PlayStation store or whatever. Yeah. Something of that nature. Um, but I think the thing that's really like, you know, that was kind of shocking to people, but people were like, Oh, well, Redfall was this, you know, sort of big disaster. Um, but like you know, this is a this is a, de a development team with a really good track record, right? So like, yes, they stumbled, but like, is that what we're doing now? Are we shuttering studios that have been around for a decade plus, making very good games, and they make one off game, and we're like, okay, that's it, death sentence for you. And so that seems extreme, but then it gets even more extreme when you look at um, you look at Tango GameWorks. And again, they make one of the most highly praised games of last year. And, you know, you're shuttering them in response. Um, I think you could make the argument that Hi-Fi Rush was like the best Xbox game of the year last year. I mean, I don't know. Exclusive. Exclusive. I yeah. mean, like, what? I mean, I guess the big competition is Starfield. And I don't, I mean, there are going to be people who argue in favor of Starfield, but I liked I don't Hi-Fi think, Rush better. I don't think there are any say, of those people are on this podcast. <laughs> well, and even, even outside of just the pod, like I don't have an Xbox, so I can't speak to Xbox exclusives, but even outside of our podcast, I feel like it was much, I feel like I saw a universal praise for Hi-Fi Rush and I saw a lot of people who were like, Starfield's fine. And that might just be because of, of the hype that was around Starfield, that Starfield wasn't bad. It was just disappointing because it didn't live up to the impossible expectations that right. people had. Yeah. And, and I don't think that's, that's not Bethesda's fault, maybe, but, but it's a little bit their fault, yeah. a little bit of the hype train. Yeah. But um, yeah, any, sorry, I didn't think I cut you off there, but just thinking about how good Hi-Fi Rush was, what I, sorry, what I'm trying to look up was, uh, what something like uh, Redfall's budget was, like what the cost was right. to make that, because it's like if you have one, I don't game know that, if that's publicly available. Yeah, if you have one game that falters, yeah. if that game was one hundred and fifty million dollars or a hundred sure. million dollars, unfortunately, I can maybe understand that a little bit. I don't think it's right, but it just goes back to the argument or the the topic that we've had a number of times about is it sustainable for games to cost this much to make? Yeah. Right. I think one of the things that makes this surprising, particularly for Tango Gameworks, right, is this is supposedly part of the Xbox strategy when it comes to Game Pass. The strategy behind Game Pass was that not everything has to be the AAA $300 million game like a Spider Spider-Man 2 or The Last of Us 2. Right, like those games, those big blockbuster style games that Sony is making, Microsoft's whole strategy, the way that they have sort of pitched it to people was, well, not every game has to be that for us. We can make these smaller games and they've allowed their studios. So Pentiment is an example of that. And then, you know, obviously Hi-Fi Rush, make these smaller games uh, that are maybe more experimental. And because they're, part of Game Pass, it, we're not as worried about it selling 10 million copies, mm -hmm. right? Whereas something like, um, you know, Starfield traditionally would have to sell that many copies just to like break even on its budget or Spider-Man, right? 
Um, and so, yeah, like to see them have this reaction, it's like, well, this is what you've been telling us your strategy is. This seems to undercut that strategy. It's very much damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's the reaction a lot of developers are taking from it, right? That's the lesson that they're getting is, well, working for Microsoft is completely cutthroat. And even when you do succeed, they may still like cut your throat. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we talked about this with Sony's layoffs not long ago, right? So some of Sony's layoffs were coming from like um, Insomniac and Naughty Dog. And you're like, those are your only two big studios, Sony. What are you doing? Like Insomniac has been the PlayStation 5. They did Miles Morales and Spider-Man 2 and Ratchet and Clank. They have been the most productive AAA studio this console generation, and you're laying people off from them? What are you thinking? Yeah. And, you know, and to see, to me, this is the equivalent of that, where you see here's a company making, right? I think that's a good point, Mario, when you say their best exclusive game of 2023 and you're like, okay, well, your reward for that is we're going to fire everyone. Um, and, you know, like, that was, Hi-Fi Rush is not a $300 million game. Like, maybe they didn't get the return on it that they were hoping for, but that is, that is you know, the ideal version of that smaller game. It was shorter in length. It was obviously smaller in budget. And they still turned out something that got people's attention and people wanted to play. Um, and to come in and sort of er- unceremoniously just can everyone. Um, and something else that somebody had pointed out was they're a Japanese studio. And for years, Microsoft has made, you know, pro- proclamations about how they want to make inroads into Japan because the Xbox doesn't sell in Japan. Like they, you know, they're basically non-existent in Japan. Mm -hmm. And here you finally have a good Japanese studio that you own and you like kill them. Like, where's the logic in that? Not a good look, Microsoft. Yeah. I was looking, I was looking for a, a tweet because, and I don't know, like one, how, accurate it is in terms of like numbers and it's obviously maybe potentially like apples and oranges but um you know they they're this tweet is basically saying that the 375 million dollars that microsoft paid to buy out bobby Kodak could have paid the salaries of the arcane and tango employees for like the next 17 years jeez and like i said that might be that might be sort of apples and oranges but at the same time, it is also like we see, like, you know, we, we talk about uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I just generally like how much money, yeah, the these higher ups make as compared to, yeah. um, you know, the the people that are actually making the games, right? Yeah, it's absurd. Yeah, and I think one of the reasons this has gotten people so worked up is this calls into question the entire strategy behind game pass. Yeah. Like where is Microsoft going from here? Because this really starts to make you question like, you know, they bought Activision and yes, the crown jewel of Activision is definitely like call of duty. And then also King with the, uh, the mobile games, candy crush and that sort of thing. But like then you also have to think they paid $79 billion for Activision. Part of that is the IP that Activision has. Mm-hmm. Like Activision's one of the oldest game publishers still around today. And they own a ton of IP. And the mindset was, well, Microsoft has a bunch of different studios. So even if, even if you fell at Redfall, why doesn't Microsoft take you and give you some other property to work with? Like you're not going to get to make an original game because you obviously like stumbled with that. But here we're going to give you one of these Activision properties to work on for your next game. Something that we feel is more um, a sure bet, Mm -hmm. right? 
And now closing these studios and laying people off, you're like, well, okay, you don't have teams to do that. So what are you doing? Like, are you going to end up in the same position that Activision was in where you were making one game a year and that was Call of Duty? It's also, in, yeah, it's also interesting thinking about like, we talked about it. I think we get, I think it's fair to say that we were positive, positive thinking about like, Hi-Fi Rush was one of these, like, we're expanding to include it onto Switch. And, right, you know, yeah. the, and it's just like, well, and, and now, I don't know, it's like, well, we're not getting anything like that again. You know, we're not getting, you know, there's no Hi-Fi Rush 2 unless they go independent. Um, but I don't even know if that's something that they could do because I want to say that was part, partnership with Bethesda. Um, right, well, the, the studio, like, let's say they regathered as a team like they wouldn't own the ip mm -hmm. right wow. so microsoft owns that now so yeah fi hi for <laughs> sure but uh <laughs> yeah it's uh, it's a decision yeah so i mean this is uh sent you know shock waves through the industry um i i think a lot of people in game development just feeling sort of horrified um, a, a few people I follow in the industry were just like, what the hell? Like, you know, what are we doing at this point? Like, if you're making the best games and you're still getting fired, like, you know, what is this industry for any of us? There is no job security. There is no safety net. Um, which, you know, I, I think takes a toll on people because, like, at some point you start looking around and you go, well, Maybe there's something else I should transition to. Um, yeah. yeah, something more stable, you know. Yeah, um, and you know the thing, or at least I, less precarious. Yeah, I've been thinking about what this sort of means. Well, let me read some of this other news here because, and then I'll talk about it. Um, so yesterday there was uh, Bloomberg had uh, this event. Uh, where they were getting different people in tech to come like be interviewed. Um, and so they had Xbox president Sarah Bond. Um, and they asked her in this interview uh, about like, you know, why are you shutting down like somebody like Tango Gameworks, who's been very successful? And she gave the the worst answer I think I've ever heard somebody give in an interview. It was just long and rambling and she said nothing and it seemed insane that she had not been prepped for this question. Like this is mm -hmm. the most obvious question anybody at Xbox is going to get asked over the next few weeks. You have to be prepared to respond to this. And it felt like she just had no idea how to give an answer to this question. And she's, she's smart. She's good. Like she's normally really good. And it felt like she was completely um, unprepared to say anything. Um, and so that has blown up. Um, and you know, there was, uh, an interview, I believe with IGN where they interviewed two former people from Xbox and they said, look, it's not Xbox anymore. It's Microsoft gaming with the implication being that Xbox is not so much running itself anymore as Microsoft has moved in and is making some of the calls which they own Xbox, that's their right, but um, that maybe that's what we're seeing here and why this seems really out of character for what Xbox has been saying for the last few years. Um, also, as part of this, uh, news has come out that Microsoft plans to launch their own game store in July. Um, so this is going, this is their own mobile game store. So this would be a game store for the Android platform and also theoretically for iOS in Europe where uh, the, the European union is forcing uh, Apple to open up for third party uh, app stores. And I don't, I don't know. Do either of you have an Android? I, I do not. Yeah. I have Samsung. So that's okay. Android. Yeah. Um, do you have any alternative app stores installed on your phone? No. I mean, I, I mean, I think it came pre-installed with the Samsung Galaxy Store, but I never look at it. I just okay. look at Google Play. Yeah, so this whole move that all these companies are doing, moving into like third-party app stores, like they think they're going to make a killing with these third-party app stores. 
is anybody asking for a Microsoft app store on their iPhone or Android? No. Literally why? We literally don't need this. Like it, it just seems like the least wanted thing from anyone. <laughs> well, it's like, okay, you can't you can't keep any other studio op- open that's under you, but sure, open up a mobile game store to do whatever. Yeah, so the reason I wanted to get to the rest of this news is this seems like Microsoft has no idea what they're doing. Mm-mm. I mean, it seems like they're completely floundering here. And, and not as well as the fish in that game that was made in a month. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, that game, the, hey, the animation on that fish fl- floundering around is pretty good. No, that's genuine. Um, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying that to sass the fish. Yeah. I'm saying that to sass Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> um. That if a student can make a game in a month with better fl- with better floundering than what you're doing right now, <laughs> you got a problem. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it's just like Microsoft seems like a company that is just out of control. Like they seem like they're just spiraling more and more out of control. Um, and like I say, this is somebody who owns an Xbox Series X is sitting under my TV. I like that system a lot. I think it's very well put together. Um, you know, I, I subscribe to Xbox Game Pass. I play a lot of games on my PC, even more than the console, actually, uh, via Game Pass, because it's a great way to try out games like Manor Lords, which I don't know if I want to drop, you know, whatever it is, $30, $40 on. Um, and... It just seems like I, I don't know what's going on. There's something going on internally at that company, and it seems like they're spiraling, and they don't know what they are they should be doing. And maybe there's too many cooks in the kitchen, and they're pulling them in too many different directions. Um, but, you know, like this seems like you start to look at this and you start to think, well, they're supposed to have a show next month. Right, it's it's the E three time. It's Summer Games Fest time. They're going to have a show. What is that show even going to look like? You just shuttered four of your studios, and a lot of a lot of players feel burned by you. I was going to say, I, I know a big part of that is also the discussion. Just because you, had, you know, brought up Game Pass, and it reminded me, and there's also talk. It was like shortly announced like the day after that there's also going to be a price increase on the Game Pass Ultimate subscription as well. That That's the expectation. That's the yeah. rumor, right? I don't think it's been officially announced oh, okay. yet, but yeah. And so just thinking about feeling burned of like you just shut down four studios, um, multiple of which have made very successful, very good games, and now you're going to charge us more money as well. For what will definitely be fewer games. Yeah. yeah. Right? Uh, but I think, yeah, an inherently worse product. I feel like, you know? Yeah. Not a good look, Microsoft. Not a good look. Yeah. And I don't know where, you know, where does this leave Xbox? Because already, I mean, Xbox has been struggling to put games out. Right? That's the other thing that makes this crazy. Like, they're struggling to get games out. And, you know, last year was a a bad year for them. Now, they had Starfield, they had Forza, but, like, Forza didn't quite hit the way they wanted it to. Starfield definitely did not hit the way they wanted it to. Um, Some people really liked both of those games, but, like, they weren't the mass market hits that I think they were anticipating. Sorry. No, I mean, so this is probably in part a reaction to that, but also, like, when you're already struggling to have enough oars in the water, it's probably not the right ideal to like shoot a couple of the rowers. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and I guess I I just like, I sort of have to wonder. um, I don't know what, you know, Starfield ended up selling. I don't know how successful it wasn't like financially, but I mean, and not that like the Jeff Keighley game awards are like the end all be all, but it's probably the biggest like, front facing you know that like people are familiar with like what people's opinions what the opinions of video games are right yeah Yeah. Um, it has become that i think so and like what was expected to be i think it's fair to say that starfield was probably supposed to be the biggest game xbox had in 
not just last year, but in a hot minute since Halo Infinite, which also probably didn't hit the way that no, they, no, you know, it did not. Like Starfield, I, I, you no, know, I not remember. to say that this is like a we put all of our eggs in the Starfield basket, but like I wouldn't be surprised if their mentality of like, okay, well, Starfield will stabilize us for a little while. It didn't even get nominated for best for best game for game of the year. Yeah, at least again from the Jeff Keighley Game right. Awards. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if, if, uh, that was their mentality and this is, yeah, that response, but it doesn't seem like the response should be to shut down studios that at least with Tango that put out one, maybe again, maybe our best game of the year. Yeah. Well, and I think, one of the things I've been thinking about with this is, look, I'm not a business person. And yeah. even if I were, I don't know the specific financials behind the situation. But it actually made me think, I, I was thinking about it over the week, and it made me think about um, when Nintendo sold Rare and, and Microsoft acquired Rare. So, like, Nintendo owned part of Rare, so they had to sell off their part. Um, and... Like the the loss of Rare for Nintendo was not about financial loss. It was about um, you know sort of mind share of the of the video game public of the consumer, right? Like it it felt like Nintendo was giving up when they yeah. you know here you're when this new upstart competitor Microsoft is buying Rare, like Rare, like the company that really sustained Nintendo during the N64 era. Yeah, made argue, you know, some of the best games on that system as well as on the Super Nintendo as well. Yeah. Um, you know, with the Donkey Kong countries and you know, yeah. GoldenEye and Perfect Dark and the Banjo. Yeah, I mean, that's outside of Super Mario 64 and Ocarina of Time, you're not going very far down the list before you hit a rare game. Yeah, I mean, when you talk about, like, the best N64 games, the most beloved, the, like, biggest mind share, and, yeah, so, like, them losing Rare at the time wasn't about a financial loss. It was about the public looked at it as, was well, Nintendo on their way out? Is yeah. Nintendo dying? And that was, I guess, during the, the GameCube era that that all went down. And it it felt like it. It felt like Nintendo was, you know, they had struggled with the N64, like, whatever you think of the quality of the games on the N64, it did not sell well compared to the way the NES and the Super Nintendo had. And then the GameCube comes out, and again, I, you know, I think there's some classic worse. games on that system, but yeah, it sells even worse. It felt like Nintendo was on its last leg, and they're selling off Rare. And so, you know, when I look at this situation, I, I, I sort of have the same feeling, like, Tango Gameworks, yes, you're going to make some money back and everything by, you know, you don't have these salaries on your books anymore and everything. I get that. And I get, like, there's a um, there's money that you are spending to finance their new game that you can maybe take and put into a different game over here. So I understand that from a business perspective, but from a mindshare perspective, from, like, a PR perspective, I look at this and go this just makes Microsoft seem weak and it makes people who are maybe on the fence about buying an Xbox say, well, they're canceling all of their games. And, you know, when they do this uh, show next month, you sort of look at it and go, you've got to make big promises to people. But even if you make big promises, why should they trust those? Yeah. Like if you come out and tell me, um, you know, uh, Machine Games is making that Indiana Jones game. And after they finish that, what do they do? And, like, I hope they make Wolfenstein 3 because I love those first two Wolfenstein games they did. But I also kind of worry, like, are they just going to shut down Machine Games? Like, you know, if that Indiana Jones game does not perform at the level they want it to. Well, and even if it performs super well it doesn't matter because they just shut down tango gameworks right yeah yeah so it's not like, even what a, is the level that it has to perform at to to 
protect the studio and people's jobs. <laughs> and so I've also been thinking about this. You can tell this has been a big topic on my mind this week. <laughs> um, I've always been thinking about this because like this last weekend, uh, they released that movie, The Fall Guy, uh, yeah. with Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt. And I went to see that movie. I think that movie's great um, for what it is. It's just a pure popcorn entertainment movie. It is very funny. It is the two of them have great chemistry on screen. There's like this, um, you know, there's a sexual spark between them and the way that, you know, the, the dialogue's playing off of each other. Uh, there's a great action scenes in that movie. Uh, it's just a whole lot of fun. That's the sort of movie I used to go see during the summer. Yeah. And that movie opened to like $28 million. Now, there's a lot of commentary about, well, $28 million, that movie has a budget. People are saying somewhere around $130 million, which means it's going to have to make somewhere north of $250 million to turn a profit. And you start looking at a movie like that and you go, man, like they made a really good movie, like probably spent too much on it. Is that movie just barely going to make a profit, just barely eke out a profit, or is it not going to? Is it going to be viewed as a failure? Are we not going to get a Fall Guy 2? Yeah. When I would much rather see that than um, another King Kong versus Godzilla film, because I went to see that yesterday, and let me tell you, that's not a very good movie. (laughs) So I'd rather see another Fall Guy movie than that, but are we not going to get that? Because the economics of making movies with streaming and with the death of physical media where you can't count on the revenue from DVD and Blu-ray sales don't exist anymore. And are we seeing the same thing in the game industry where it doesn't matter if you make something good that's a good product with, you know, a, with Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt's faces in it. The two actors who were in the number one and number two films last <laughs> year, Barbie and Oppenheimer, And if that movie can't be successful and if Hi-Fi Rush can't be successful, what hope is there for the studio system, whether it's the Hollywood studio system or it is, you know, the Microsoft, Xbox, PlayStation studio system? Because it feels like it feels like those are dying. Yeah. It feels like the Hollywood studio system is dying in the face of streaming um, at least those smaller movies, right? Like we'll still get our Deadpool movie because that'll make a billion dollars. But like you don't want everything to have to be Deadpool. Yeah. And you don't want everything to have to be Spider-Man 2. And it feels like maybe that's all that's left for these big companies in media anymore. Like these big bets. Everything has to be a Grand Slam you can't have a single or a double anymore. It's like real baseball. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah. I mean, when baseball fell in love with the home run, right. And like everybody forgot how to play baseball anymore. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I think that's really interesting. Just thinking about you've got either what will be, as I just said, we are putting all of our eggs in this basket and we will let the indie studios can, can do all of the other experimental risky things yeah well and it's something we've seen in other er areas like that's what happened or nintendo nintendo can do the risky thing yeah nintendo (laughs) but But like speaking even outside of nintendo doesn't do a lot of those risky things anymore sure i mean but like we've it's the same thing we saw happen with broadway you know now you you can't open anything we get mean girls the musical now yeah because it's a it's an ip they can they yeah. know they can build an audience off of. Yeah. And it's like anything, and even, even off Broadway is starting to get that way now where it's like anything, anything risky and interesting is really happening in like the off, off Broadway area now. Cause yeah, if it, if it doesn't, if it's not Phantom of the Opera or Hades town or right. Hamilton, like you're not making a big enough profit to justify it. Yeah. I mean, I I think, you know, we definitely see that with 
yeah, I, I'm not nearly the <laughs> the Broadway fan that you are, but like I, I think that's been obvious to me. With like I said, like you get Mean Girls the musical, you get this movie the musical, you get this movie the musical, right? Like it's it's we're going to translate things that we know are already uh, solid IP that will at least be able to get an opening. People will come for the first couple of months. And, you know, maybe we can break even and eke out a profit versus rolling the dice on something more original. Yeah. And I think it just, it ultimately results in a lot of cookie cutter yeah, uh, products where yeah. we're fitting this formula because we know this formula works. Yeah. And I think, you know, we don't, you know, there's just, there, yeah, there are a lot of other examples. I was just listening to a, another podcast. I, we never ended up talking about WrestleMania, mostly because I think Christina wasn't wasn't here, and I figured, oh, you know, I know they would be interested in it as well. But I've gotten, you know, been watching a lot more, been watching the weekly shows, um, and I've recently started listening to the Undertaker's podcast, which is very <laughs> weird hearing him as like a regular guy. Um, <laughs> but uh, but you know, he's he's he was even talking about it just in like the you see a lot of these guys who are up and coming are just like they're doing what is the formula. You don't see a lot of these weird, interesting gimmicks anymore. Yeah. We're like really leaning into these weird, interesting gimmicks because that's a lot riskier. Right. And you, you know, if it doesn't get the pay future, off the future endeavors message, yeah. uh, if it doesn't hit, I feel like 10 years ago, that's what kind of killed wrestling interest for me was so many. It was like, here's Biff Jackson. <laughs> here's and, guy. <laughs> yeah. Like here's random guy. And you're like, okay, so like, why am I interested in him? And, you know, occasionally there was somebody who just had a look, right. That made them interesting, uh, a Roman reigns or something, you know, I'm like, I understand that look is still crafted and everything, but there'd be a guy who had that look where you were like, oh, at least he's just dis distinct looking. Mm -hmm. Once, and so the, the example he used was Bray Wyatt, like Bray yeah. Wyatt was doing weird stuff. He was pushing the envelope and, you know, we don't have to get into wrestling talk, but like he was pushing the envelope with a weird gimmick and something that was not conventional. Yeah. You just don't see that anymore. And so I think you're, you know, you're seeing it with games, you're seeing it with yeah, Kofi Broad and Broadway, it sounds like. And so, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's something we're seeing all Across over. Across the board. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the sort of homogenization of all media, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like everything has to be like completely bland and disinteresting. And yeah, we are getting that from indie games. You're right. Um, we're getting some interesting stuff. I mean, obviously like mini shoot adventure is really cool. Bellatro is really cool, right? Power like, wash sim. Well, yeah. Like, I mean, even, like <laughs> power wash sim yeah. was really cool. Yeah. Like, who, who, who looked and thought we should make a simulation game for power washing and give it an actual plot that, <laughs> but uh, like Nintendo doesn't look and do that. Right, and I think the thing that's like kind of sad is we used to get that from major publishers. Yeah. Like I often say that the Dreamcast is one of my favorite consoles, if maybe not my favorite console, but like certainly in like the top two or three. And the reason why was it, you had Sega, one of the biggest game you know publishers in the world, just doing the most insane things on that console. Like we get Shenmue, right, like which becomes the groundwork for all – open world games these days and you get things like Seaman, and, but like, then you're also getting like, Hey, we're going to go make a, a tennis game and we're going to go make this and we're going to go make this. And you're like, nobody's doing that today. Well, like, and, and we've had this conversation before too, even like, like kingdom hearts would not be made today. A, a, a something, a crossover game could be made, but no one would, no one today would say, if that didn't already exist, no one today would say, you know what needs an official video game? Disney and Final Fantasy. Yeah, it wouldn't cross over with Square Enix at right. least. Yeah. I think Final Fantasy does not hold the uh, cultural weight that it did when the crossover first happened. Yeah. And like someone would look and say, you know, hey, why don't we have... I feel like people now look and say, like, you know, why don't we have crossover games of the, the same genre? So, like, why do... You know, why would we make just a Spider-Man game when we can make a Spider-Man game that has Iron Man and Captain America and Deadpool? Right. And, like, people might say, like, oh, why why would we make a 
just a Superman game when we could have Superman and Captain America together. But like people aren't looking at these radically different things and saying like, that's what that's, that's, that needs to be more than just someone's fan fiction. That needs to be an official game. (laughs) Yeah, no, I mean, I I think that's something that it's that experimentation, right? Like that idea of final fantasy and Disney was really a sort of Reese's moment. It was somebody putting chocolate and peanut butter together and going, wow, this tastes really great for like a bunch of sickos. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like that, that found an audience, right? Like, and no. like on the surface, you would not think it would. And it's a big sort of like risk, um, but not as big a risk back then, right? When they're making that first game for the PlayStation 2, they're not spending $300 million on that. Um, now, I guess maybe... Uh, Kingdom Hearts 4, maybe by the time that game comes out, they will have spent $300 million on In it. 35 years. Well, and I, th- and I think a big part of it is, you know, Kingdom Hearts 4 can come out because it's a, it's established itself. Like, exactly. Even if those games are do not come close to what they were, and even if for most people they're like purely nostalgia-driven, um, I, just, I think it just comes back to protecting the IP. Right. Yeah. Right. If we make a game that flops with this IP, how is it going to hurt this? You know, I, we, we talked about it with the, um, I don't remember what the game was called. Uh, though, but the one that's made in, in sort of the style of like the CDI Zelda games. Oh yeah. Could you imagine if the CDI Zelda games or something of that, like poor sort of, you know, that negative a response, if that were to come out today, how would that, like decimate the legend of Zelda IP. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it would be the, I feel like it would be the, the closest I can think of, of like something where I, where I can relate it would be like when the, when the star Wars prequel movies came out. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the thing that helped with those CDI games is one, it was pre social media. Sure. And two, like the CDI was not widespread, right? Like it wasn't like it came out for the Sega Genesis. Like, sure, nobody owned a CDI. Yeah, <laughs> but that's what I mean. Like, if but like you, if someone released the Zelda CDI games and it just it was the Zelda Xbox 360 games. If if Tears of the Kingdom was that bad of a game, right? You know, yeah, it, yeah. Or or and and this is not necessarily to the same magnitude. Just to like Halo Infinite did not hit. People do not view Halo the way that people once viewed Halo. No. And that yeah. was a foundational like IP for Microsoft. Yeah. And when we did the, the Mount Rushmore thing God, right. that's last year at this point, yeah. there was a point where like Master Chief would, I feel like have to be on, on something like that. Oh yeah. And now, eh, maybe like. Maybe Master Chief's butt can be on the back. <laughs> but like, yeah, no. And so it's. I, a little I, treat for OJ. <laughs> it's just, I think it, it all comes back to. And this is not just, again, it's, it's everything just being so risk averse. Yeah. That. Right we have to do whatever we can to protect what we have that is a hit and we cannot take the the risk of it falling off. Yeah, it's why we get very bland Star Wars today, right? Like a lot of Star Wars has been very bland over the last decade. And the reason why is because they're extremely risk averse. Well, and we're even seeing it with, you know, with things that don't necessarily have 20 years between them, like, the Star Wars trilogies do like I feel like like the MCU has become that yeah yeah and and to their credit uh, Kevin Feige has been very kind of upfront and honest about that and like hey we we failed there was some comment you know some interview he did where he said yeah like we have not kept up the quality we should have yeah and so it's like okay cool you recognize that now fix it (laughs) yeah so um Yeah, I mean, like, look, we can talk all about this and everything. Like, the one thing I think we should address is, you know, as always when we talk about these closings is that actual people are losing their actual jobs. This has actual consequences for their lives. We can sort of, um, you know, we can sort of Monday night quarterback it here and talk about, well, how is this going to affect the Xbox and games and everything? But at the end of the day real people are suffering because of this. Um, and so we wish them well. We hope that they land on their feet uh, quickly in response to this. 
But let's move on. Um, speaking of Nintendo, um, who is the one company that hasn't been falling flat on their face <laughs> lately, um, they came out and announced through a tweet that they will announce the Switch 2 this fiscal year. So that their fiscal year extends through March of 2025. So next March. Okay, because I was because I was looking at the next piece, the next thing on here with so spoilers that there's a Nintendo Direct in June, and I was like, the fiscal year ends June thirtieth, but I've seen them deliberate. I've seen they deliberately said this Nintendo Direct will not talk about the Switch two. Right. So I was like, what? Well, <laughs> the disconnect there. <laughs> their fiscal year ends in March. Yeah, that would be why. So okay. um, they're saying that with. Before next March, they will announce the Switch 2. Now, that doesn't mean the Switch 2 will come out by next March. It just means that they will announce it. So they could wait till next March and announce it, and it comes out fall of 2025 or something. I think most people still believe that system will come out next spring sometime. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we get a fall announcement for the upcoming March. Yeah, that's what they did with the Switch, you yeah. know, last time when they announced it. So yeah, I think that was an E3 announcement. Was it? I think so. Okay, I thought maybe they did it in the fall. Uh, I know it came out in March. So yeah, yeah. The or if it wasn't E3, it was essentially that time period. Yeah. yeah. Um. So yeah, Alicia, what you were alluding to, the next point on there is that they announced that they will also have a Nintendo Direct in June and that that will uh, not have any news about the Switch 2. Is and this that a full Direct? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is going to lay out the the rest of the year for the Switch. Interesting. Because yeah. like, there's nothing announced for the Switch after um, the Luigi's Mansion 2 remake, which comes out in June, I believe. Okay. So after that comes out, there's nothing else announced for the rest of the year, um, which, you know, they have, I, I know people think they delayed the switch too, and it was supposed to come out this fall sometime. But like, when you look at this, you go, there has to be something, right? They're going to put something out on the switch in the next year. Yeah. Well, and I, what I've been hearing is that, you know, especially with the switch to having backwards compatibility as is the rumor and so it's probably going to be anything that comes out in in the remainder of, you know, whatever they announce in June is probably also going to have at least something in that list is going to also be a launch title for the Switch 2. Yeah. Yeah, we might get some of those like like Zelda was like a, a cross platform game. That's that, the words I was looking for. I was that, like, yeah, where they came out on the Wii U and then the Switch when it came. <laughs> yeah, it would be enhanced in some way on the Switch to run at a better frame rate, you know, like higher resolution, something like that. Um, let's see. Um, let's skip down one here because speaking of announcements, I w- so this kind of makes me interested more in the Nintendo Direct because you start to think, well, they can't have that much. And then they just out of nowhere announced a game that they have coming out this year before that Nintendo Direct. They could have saved this for the Nintendo Direct, but they went ahead and announced that uh, they are making a game called Nintendo World Championships NES Edition. So this is harkening back to, I think it's 1990, they had the first Nintendo World Championships. Um and they had a special cartridge that played Super Mario Brothers, Rad Racer, and Tetris, I believe. And so you would have to uh, get as high a score as you could on those three games. You played for a limited amount of time, and then they would add up the scores, and whoever had the highest score at the competition would win something, and then they just flew some of those people out to Los Angeles, I believe it was, and they crowned a national championship or a world champion of Nintendo games. So if you've ever seen, um, you know, uh, the wizard, um, the movie where they show off, um, super Mario brothers three for the first time in the U S at least, um, that, you know, sort of the way that looks at the end is what the Nintendo world championships were. Um, so that cartridge that they used in those, the people who were like the top, 
finishers, they gave them a copy of that cartridge that is now like one of the most valuable NES cartridges in the world because it's so incredibly rare. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're basing this off this loosely, but like this actually seems to have more in common with uh, the NES remix games that Nintendo put out. Um, so this is going to feature 13 games and over 150 challenges in those 13 games. These are all NES games, so it is uh, Mario 1, 2, and 3, as well as the Lost Levels. It is Zelda 1 and 2. Um, it is Kid Icarus, Metroid, Kirby's Adventure. Um, not Tetris, because they don't have the rights to Tetris anymore. <laughs> and not Rad Racer, because... I guess they don't have the rights to Rad Racer. I, I think that was, they just published that in the U.S., but Nintendo didn't actually make Rad Racer. Um, but anyways, this game is coming out, and it's coming out, um, I believe, in June sometime, or maybe it's early July. Um, this and just looks so cool. Yeah, I actually thought of you, Mario, when I saw this because they said it was going to have like leaderboards for like uh, speed running and everything. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it seemed like something you'd be particularly interested in. Yeah, I mean, it's really cool. It it, it feels very. I don't know if there's going to be like a. I mean, I guess obviously they just said there's going to be leaderboards. If it, at the very least, it it almost just feels like you could treat this like a Steam achievements you know, for like a, these old games, like a, we've mm. I- implemented these challenges for you mm. to try to do in these old games. I know that there's already like the retro achievements already exists, but obviously Nintendo doesn't have any partnership with that, but um, it's really cool. It's really cool as a way to, I think one, just like, obviously they do it with the, the, mm, the, old consoles. Oh, the Nintendo Switch Online the, Yeah, stuff. yeah. Um, you know, sort of introducing people to these old games. But uh, it's another way of just getting to re-experience them in, in a new manner. So, yeah, I think that's really cool. Yeah, and I think this is about the level of software we expect from the Switch in its final year, right? Like, final main year. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, it'll obviously stick around for a few more years. Um, so... At least until the Switch 2 gets announced. I think you'll get a, if there's like a, you know, new 3D Mario game, I think you you could see that being like a cross-platform, but I think... Right. I don't think you'll get any sort of major announcement like that until it's a, this is coming out for both the Switch and whatever our next platform is. Right. Which I wouldn't be surprised if that's what the the new, like, Legends Arceus... um, Oh, the Legends ZA? Yeah. Yeah. Whatever it's called. Yeah. Yeah. you know, that, that is, I don't think there's a release period for that, but I think it's not yet next spring. Yeah. And that I, That's one that we expect to be a cross platform launch s- title. But um, yeah, but anyways, yeah, that, I think that you're not going to see anything major just for the switch Yeah. until, yeah. Yeah. I, I think, um, it's just kind of interesting, right? Like why announce this right now, other than you, you want to start kind of the hype machine and everything, you know, pre E3 time, pre um, your show, uh, your Nintendo direct. Um, But it kind of makes me more optimistic that they might have more for the rest of the year than Mm -hmm. I was anticipating. Because if you're really struggling to fill out your year, then I feel like you delay this game and you say, we'll hold this and put it out in August or September or something. So the, our year does not look quite as anemic. Yeah, because I know you've got a Thousand Year Door remake coming out in just a couple of weeks. Uh, right. That comes out in May. And then I, I'm pretty sure that the Luigi's Mansion 2 comes out in June. Yeah, I can't think. I mean, I know they've previewed stuff, but there's no I, no dates associated with it. I know the, there was a latent game announced, but I, yeah. you know, it was never, never anything uh, more than just the announcement. But say. that's not Nintendo First Party. Oh, that's true. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, like, I I think this looks really cool. And I think it's also, like, it makes me a little bit more, <laughs> like, less scared of what that Nintendo Direct's going to be. Because <laughs> I, I think that could be really anemic. But, like, again, if they're putting something out now, it tells me that 
they feel like they have enough to fill a direct Mm -hmm. yeah without this being there um so, anyways, um, also Nintendo related news. They have added uh, they added their first female board member in 2020, which uh, kind of tells you a lot. Um, and then they have announced that they are looking to add at least three more women now to their board. So, um, you know, Nintendo got a little taste of diversity and was like, "Hey, this is like actually pretty good," and maybe this is pointing us in some directions we wouldn't normally go in. Um, and, you know, as we always talk about, like that's the real value of diversity is having somebody in the room who can speak up and say something. Yeah. I just, I'm like, I, I, I feel, I feel like I'm being cynical when I look at this and I'm just like having war flashbacks to the Avengers end game moment when they're like, let's have all the female superheroes pass the glove and, <laughs> I'm like, mm. like, okay, we're looking to add three more women. Cool. Good. You do you want a pat on the back, Nintendo? Like, can we can we be? I I get I get. Trust me, I get why we need to specify that we are looking to add three more women. But also, like, I don't know how big is their board. I guess. Yeah. Because I'm like, if it's if they have a board of ten people and they're looking to add three w- more women, okay, that's adding some more balance. But if they have a board of like thirty people and we're adding three more women, okay. Well, <laughs> well, I I think I think I share that cynicism when it's hey, pat us on the back. We added a woman after a hundred years yeah. of being in business. <laughs> we added one woman to our board. I, I think and now the fact four that, years later we're adding three more. <laughs> well, but I think the fact that they are following it up by adding more women is at least a positive trend. Yeah, it's an overdue it's, positive trend, but it is a positive trend towards. Yeah, you know. it's it's a step. Um. So you know, like th- that'll be interesting to see. Like, does that affect Nintendo? Does that affect the like sort of you know corporate? Um, Yeah, I think the corporate mentality of Nintendo. I think one of the things that's really interesting to me about this is. Okay, we had one female board member and then like we talked so much with Princess Peach Showtime about like how we haven't gotten a girly game in so long. And that's like now that this girly game has been really successful. Aha, let's add more women. Yeah, I mean, like probably they don't have enough time to like react to that game specifically but like I, I do wonder if like do we get a do we get that princess peach game because there's a woman on the board saying why aren't we targeting girls more yeah like i i could see this leading to us getting more games like that which would make me happy yeah i mean i i think one of the things that's really interesting is the number of women i know who don't play many video games let's say um, and during COVID got really into, um, into animal crossing. Yeah. Right. Like the number of women I know who are like, Oh, I don't play video games, but I bought a switch so I could play animal crossing in 2020. And you're like, okay. And then like now they've moved on and they're playing, um, you know, they're playing stuff like Stardew Valley and like yeah. they found now that they have the switch, they're finding games to play on that switch. And so, you know, I think when Nintendo makes those sorts of games like that appeal, not just to women, but like have that more broad appeal to all genders. Right. Um, well, and like, you know, we, we've talked before, so I'm, I'm not going to go on the whole thing again, but the sense of like, you know, when I was little, when I was a kid, you, you were you were going to get made fun of either way because the, the guys at least, the girls would make fun of you for playing any video games and the guys at least wouldn't make fun of you if you were playing something like Skyrim but would make fun of you if you were playing something like Cooking Mama. And so, like, I, I say this of, like, I, I hope that balancing the room a little helps us get more of of that recognition and also that they're not doing it as a, well, let's get more women on board to get more girl. How do, how do we appeal to girls? How do we make things pink and 
just like recognizing the nuances of all of this. Yeah. I mean, though, I, I would say that there's almost definitely, Hey, how do we get more women into our games? Like, I mean, I hate to be cynical yeah. about it. Well, but like, well, but I, I'm just, you know, I have a lot of mixed feelings on, but, I, but I think, I hope that it, I hope that adding more women allows for the nuance because like if, if you put me as the only female board member, you know, I would come at this and say, yeah, like I didn't play like cooking mama or we should buy Sega so we can make (laughs) Sonic games. (laughs) But it's like adding more women allows for, you know, maybe I didn't play cooking mama growing up, but the girl next to me did and loved it. And so like getting that nuance of Mm. we can make girly games and we can make games that appeal to anyone regardless of gender and we can make you know boyish games quote unquote whatever that means it's just that you know getting to the sort of conversation of diversity it's just the recognition that like one woman is not a representative of all yeah women the same way we would never wonder woman I guess I I'm not a wonder woman wonder woman yeah but sadly (laughs) she's not real uh (laughs) If we could um, put Wonder Woman on the board. Excuse me. Like, you say that to Diana. <laughs> how that goes. Um, but the same way we would never expect one man to be a representative of all men. Right. It's just, uh, you know, I, I, I don't like, I, I guess it's the cynicism. I guess it's the, like, I have to laugh because it just, like, feels ridiculous. Like, again, after a hundred years, we, we tried this thing and, oh, my God, wow, it worked out. We should do this more often. Yeah. Um, it reminds me when movie studios make a movie like Barbie and they're like, women like to go to movies? <laughs> what? And like, what well, a concept. You know, like that was just a fluke. And then they make bridesmaids and then they make, you know, whatever else. And like, they keep like making these movies that target women that are good movies and women flock to go see them. And then they always seem shocked every time. Like, how is this, how is this possible? <laughs> <laughs> who are these strange creatures <laughs> who are going to our movies? We don't understand. And okay, I, I I also do have to acknowledge, acknowledge a retractment. I did just look up. Nintendo's current board is 10 people, so adding three women will actually be significant. That'd be 40% of their board. That that will be significant, so I, I retract my judgment on that front. And I, <laughs> but I think you're right to be cynical, like at, at least at first, right? The And I think the one woman is perfectly fine to be cynical about. I think, again, this is a sign of maybe a, like movement towards progress, like maybe balancing out that board, like, you know, it's still underrepresentative, but like maybe we're getting closer to that. Well, and it's like, I, I feel like once we, once we get closer to that balance, we can stop saying, oh, we need to add three more women and we can look equally at the candidates and say, we get more women, we get more men, we get more non-binary folks, we get more trans folks, whatever it be. Like it, it would be nice to not to, to not feel like it needs to be targeted to, yes, we need to get more women in order to feel like women will get the role. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I, I think at this point they have to. Do they that, do. Right. Like, and, and that's why it's, it's a step. Um, all right. Well, if that news, uh, if that news bothers you, I have some news that'll make you happy. There's a new Sonic game coming out. It's called Sonic Rumble. <laughs> it's a mobile game. It is a Fall Guys like multiplayer game for mobile devices. Um, this showed some behind the back running sequences, um, and then also some side scrolling uh, perspective. Um, are you excited for a Sonic Rumble? I think it'll be fun. I th- I'm I'm here for just straight fun on that. <laughs> That's just going to be goofy and light, and I'm here for it. They showed like a, a, kind of the whole cast of <laughs> Sonic characters in there. So sorry, I just like I just I nothing. I no. just like if this game is as broken as all their other games, it's whoever can withstand <laughs> the glitches <laughs> the longest. <laughs> Does this game absolutely destroy you because you just (laughs) randomly got owned by it? And, you know, I think their mobile games have been, I haven't, 
like I don't, I haven't played. I don't think any of their mobile games, but my sister does, and so I think that the mobile games aren't broken. That should be that should be part of their game design for this game. I'm not gonna lie. It's like a <laughs> are you phased through the ground. Ah, that's, <laughs> it's unfortunate. That's just part of what it is. It's <laughs> part of playing a Sonic game. That's 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 the Fall Guys element. <laughs> you just got eliminated because of the the design. Oh man! I said they can barely make a game when there's one character on the screen. Now imagine there being a hundred of them. <laughs> Y'all are way stuck in 2006. <laughs> Oh, those I, games I, I were not good for a lot longer than 2006. I think Sega is stuck in 2006. I think that's the problem. Um, no, I, like, I will not play this on my phone. If they bring this to consoles or PC, I might play it. Yeah. Um, I like Fall Guys. And so it, if this is neat, right? And, like, I think there is a way to do, like, that, that Super Mario 35 that Nintendo sure. did. Where you were, thir- you know, thirty-five people on the same map, you know, speed yeah. running through the levels. That was really cool. So, like, if you take that and do something with Sonic, I think there's the possibility to do something really cool with that. Yeah. Well, and I think, yeah, I I've generally just like Fall, Fall Guys is very much a game that's there for me. Like, I watched my friends play it when they played on stream, but like, I never played it. I never. Oh, the whole the whole wipeout aesthetic was never really my vibe, so that's all. That's also part of why I'm like, eh. But I'm like, I th- I think so. That- this is perfectly made for you. <laughs> it's got the Sonic vibe instead. <laughs> nah, but I'm like, I, but I think it it's definitely one of those that I look at. I'm like, this this will be fun for the people who play it. I hope. And if it's free, I'll probably download it and play it a little bit, but. I think the fact that it's a mobile game, I why well, would not? I would check it out if it were on some on like PC or something like that or Switch. But I don't know if a mobile mobile device will oh, and see push for, me. And see for me, I'm the opposite. Like because mm. I don't I don't have any PC gaming that I do. Yeah. So like I'm like the fact that it is a mobile game means yeah, probably I'll probably you know I expect about mobile game quality and <laughs> right. All right. Um, well, I think that does it about for news. Um, so let's wrap it up with our big question. And since this is finals week um, and we are all trying to wind down and then hopefully like be able to relax going into next week, though, I guess if you're teaching a summer class, then maybe you're having to turn around really quick and prepare, prepare for that. Um, what game are you looking forward to playing now that finals are over and Alicia, is there a game that um, has been on your backlog, something that you've really been wanting to delve into? And now that you have some free time with finals over, is there something you're hoping to jump into? I think I've, I've got two that are on my mind. One is I'm looking forward to finally going to target and using my gift card to buy princess peach (laughs) showtime. Cause Y'all know the struggle. I, I, I've wanted to buy that game since it came since release, and I just have not made it back out to Target since getting my gift card fixed. So I'm I'm looking forward to that. And then, of course, with my current hyperfixation, I am very excited to keep playing the Ace Attorney games and see not guilty and feel not guilty <laughs> because I won't be like, I should be doing homework or work or anything, but just feel like, yes, I get to just sit and play switch for 12 hours straight. All right. Uh, Mario, how about you? Yeah. Um, so last week or maybe two weeks ago, I ended up buying stellar blade. I have not played it at all. So I'll play that. It's annoying that that game is now the center of the discourse of just the craziest people online, but um, <laughs> I've heard good things about it. People seem to enjoy it. Uh, the com- people speak highly of the combat. Um, but uh, yes, so but what if you can't put your girl into like the skimpiest outfit imaginable? I think I'll survive. No, oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, that's not what I'm, I hear from people online. True. I've not seen any disc- What <laughs> do I want to know? Probably not. Um, so like I said, I bought that a couple of weeks ago. I'll look forward to playing that. And then I'll be going home 
back to the Bay Area in June. So I'll bring either the Switch or the Steam Deck and find some long, ridiculously long, maybe like JRPG to get into one of the personas or something. Sounds good. Um, well, let's see. There is a new game that's just come out called Animal Well, um, which is getting very, very positive response um, and apparently has um, some hidden elements to it uh, that make it especially cool. Uh, so I'm really excited to play that and that I believe it just came out maybe today. Um, so to be able to really, really d- dive into that and kind of uh, – enjoy that and then also um i've been wanting to play but just have not had the time to play hell divers so um it seems like now may be the time to kind of get into that and try it a bit and see what all the hype is for that um so i I think you know that's probably um that's probably my plans going forward nice um All right. Thank you, Alicia and Mario. Thank you for those of you listening. Um, As always, you can check out past episodes and other content at salukigames.com. And we will be back soon with another episode. Bye.